Great. Well, welcome, everyone. I'm the Master of Ceremony, Jasmine Mejia Munoz, and I'm with the Water Quality Program at the Monterey Bay National Marine Sanctuaries. So we're excited to be a part of this event today. Um, and again, you know, we, we're really lucky that the weather is right in place and that everyone was able to come in and celebrate the Well Festival, which is a really important festival for our region each year, and we celebrate it with lots of gusto. And so our speaker next is going to be Peggy Strap, and she will be presenting on the Marine Life Studies Well Entanglement Team. And uh, Peggy actually has a very interesting story where she is a native of Michigan, but she really got enchanted with wells during a well washing trip out in Hawaii. And while she was out there, that really changed her life view. And so in 2006, she founded the Marine Life Studies, which is dedicated to research, education, and well rescue out in Moss Landing, California. And um, Peggy also volunteers uh, herself, and she served as the executive director ever since. And she's the co-founder of the Well Entanglement Team, commonly known as WET. Uh, she's the co-investigator, level three responder under NOAA MMHSRP permit for a well rescue, and the principal investigator under a NOAA endangered species permit uh, to conduct research on whales and dolphins within the Monterey Bay National Marine Sanctuary. So with that, I welcome Peggy. Uh, stage is all yours. Well, welcome, everyone. <laughs> I wanted to have my little whale, but I forgot it. Um, you can go to the next, next, yeah. Um, so for some of you have seen me present in the past, but I'm just quickly going to go through these to tell people that have never heard of us how we started. In the spring of 2006, we started Marine Life Studies. But in the fall, during a fundraising garage sale, we got a call about an entangled whale. I was part of the network in Hawaii. I re, um, volunteered for them for 10 years. Um, and we were part of the disentanglement network with Ed Lyman. And my co-founder is Mary Whitney. She gave us our first grant from Fluke Foundation. And, and she also volunteered for a team in Hawaii called Whale Trust. Next. So this is what happened in, during the fundraising grand, um, garage sale in Tangle Well in Carmel Bay. And so there was no teams north of like Orange County. So we contacted um, Ed Lyman and he put us in touch with people. We were able to get the whale disentangled, but not in the method I had been trained or we know was the correct method um, so then that's when we decided to start wet. And this is just a video to kind of show you um, some entanglements. Reports of entangled whales have significantly increased off the coast of California. As you can see, they are pretty devastating. These gentle giants are suffering from life-threatening entanglements. These entanglements can lead to a slow and painful death, as seen in these photos with the line wrapped around the tail area and the line through its mouth near its eye as the whale gazes at us. But there's hope. Working under a special federal permit with the Marine Mammal Health and Stranding Response Program, we have a trained team that gives whales another chance at life, always working from small boats, never getting in the water with the whales, as it is too dangerous for the whale and the rescuers. By using tools specially designed to disentangle whales, along with proven methods, we are able to free whales in distress. WET plays a pivotal role in saving these whales. Yes. Wet is saving whales one at a time. That was an entanglement that started here in Monterey Bay. We went down to Santa Barbara, Barbara Channel Islands twice. On the second time, we were able to free that whale. I was on the science boat doing documentation. That was me. I had friends from Michigan that called me and go, is that you? <laughs> so anyway, we um, um, have done a lot of different things over the years. We started our quest. We got um, a grant from IFAW, so we had wet on wheels. We produced um, marine mammal guides that show 
what to do if you see an entangled whale. Um, you know, then we got, we had a 19 foot Donzi we did all this work from. And then in 2015, we got a 40 foot North Sea Cutter Albin. And since then, we've done a lot of work to that. We got a specialized inflatable called a wing that's designed specifically for whale disentanglement. Um, then we put a davit system on, and we have everything for a complete disentanglement on our vessel. If we don't have enough crew on board that day, because we do boat surveys as well for our, under our research permit, we have partners that will bring our crew out. So our goal is to get out and be with the entangled well as quick as possible to relieve like a fisherman or a, a whale watch boat or any, anyone, a private citizen that are standing by. Next. And so this is just a testimonial from Paul Munchell, who used to be the superintendent for the Monterey Bay National Marine Sanctuary. So we have lots of partners. We are not alone in this. We could not do this without such the amazing community that we have here. And so, you know, we have a lot of people on the top. In fact, Fred Sharp has been on a couple um, rescues with us down here. Um, and then the whale watching and fishing community have been incredible. So we want to give a lot of thanks to all of them. Next. So why do they get entangled? No. There's lots of reasons, but this whale is not entangled. We have pictures at our booth and people think it's entangled, it's not. It's just playing with kelp. We watched this whale for two hours play with this. Now when it wrapped the kelp around its mouth, it can break it. But if it's blue steel line, they cannot. So can they tell the difference? I don't think so. They play around with anything in their, in their watery world. I saw dolphins when I did research in the Bahamas. One dolphin had a plastic bag on its fin, it dropped it, it got it on its tail, then it dropped it and the next dolphin picked it up. And the problem is there's such a large occurrence of fishing and feeding at the same time. And the, when the fishing's good, that's also a good feeding time for whales. So part of it is that, and that's just one mile outside of Moss Landing. And those, they're doing a vertical lunge feed right there. And that boat was so small, it scared the crap out of him. <laughs> Next. And so if we get a, if there's a report that they um, call into the SOS whale or to the Coast Guard, um, we came up with that um, number years ago because um, Hawaii, Alaska, the East Coast all had hotlines and we did not. So we were going to raise money for it, but then Noah finally said, okay. And so there's our newer boat. It's a 2006 North Sea Cutter. And that's our previous inflatable, but we got a new one that's on the back of the boat now. So once we get a call, we mobilize immediately. Next. So the very first thing you do when you come upon an entangled well is the assessment. We don't just motor right in. We stay back. We use um, stills, video. And now with the drones, we can use drones. And we've even used planes to get that documentation as well. But you can see there, it, not every entanglement's the same. So everyone requires a, an assessment and to decide which line to cut. Because you, uh, you, we never attach anything to the whale. We'll attach it to the trailing line, our working line. And if you cut the wrong line that's with your working line, then you may not be able to get close enough to the whale again to disentangle it. So you can see all the different varieties of entanglements. This one on the bottom over here, no one had ever seen metal on a, a whale. And we tracked that whale, and we were promoting it all the way up the whole west coast because it was supposed to come by the coast, and we had lookouts all over. Then someone sighted it in Half Moon Bay, but they didn't tell anyone. And then the next day, someone called me and said a fisherman had seen it, and it hadn't gone up as far to up the coast as we had anticipated. John Kalamakitis at Cascadia said a lot of times they'll just kind of hang around there, but no one ever sighted it again. Um, we're not really sure what that was, but um, from looking at um, different fisheries, it might have been from oyster farming. And they, they you know, it, and it had a bar above and that bar below from the pictures, but we can't confirm it's that. So we never saw that whale again. 
Now, this is um, really from the East Coast Center for Coastal Studies, where they developed a lot of the tools. They were first in the nation, really, to develop tools and to disentangle. So what you see on the surface looks like, oh, that's a, just a simple entanglement. We can just cut that line, and it'll be free. Next. But this is the actual entanglement from the Center for Coastal Studies. So that is not a simple disentanglement whatsoever. It's very complex. Next. So, so if you ever see an entangled whale, these are the photos that we really like to get from the private citizens or whale watchers or whoever is standing by, Coast Guard sometimes. And so the left dorsal, the right dorsal, and the fluke. Oftentimes we don't see the fluke because if it's entangled, it, it can't raise its fluke. So for years we've been during our research, we'll take the left and right dorsals, and you know we have a whole um, catalog, and we didn't have it printed a catalog, but we have all those so that we could go back and look to see which dorsal would match. And, and they will change over time with getting additional scarring, but it gives you a, a, a starting point. So, and these are the kind of photos we need from the air. Either stills, or we get drone footage, or the U.S. Coast Guard Auxiliary has been a great partner of ours, and they've um, gotten photos from the air. But you can see how much different they are. So here's an overhead video. And then next, here's some underwater footage. Oh, oh no, we never get in the water ever with a GoPro on a long stick. We have um, many of those. And we have some um, aluminum poles too that we utilize. So when you see this, I mean, if it wasn't for the air, this particular animal, we could not see the entanglement from the boat. We could only see it. So that's why we don't rush up, because then we could get our prop caught on a line and then be part of the problem. So we never want to do that. In fact, I had a, a private boat once get stuck on a tangled whale. They went between us and the whale. The whale was down, and we're like, and we thought, oh, thank God he got by. The whale came up and blew, and it, they came back at the whale, and then they got their prop stuck just right outside in front of Hopkins Marine Station. <laughs> And so then the Coast Guard was bringing out a couple team members, and he could see it. He goes, I said, yep, you need to come and rescue them. So then they had to change from bringing our crew to, um, you know, a response. And they wanted us to pick them, get them off the boat, but we're not trained in that. So we said, hang on, the Coast Guard's coming. But the whale came up, and there was some slack, and they were able to get it off the prop. But they were going on Nantucket sleigh ride backwards. And they had three adults, adults and four kids. I bet they'd never go near a whale again. <laughs> yeah. And, and uh, it was so scary. And the kids and all of them were screaming at us. But we were not trained in rescuing someone from a boat. If they were in the water, we would definitely have picked them up. Um, but um, once we attached the telemetry, which is that green buoy right there, um, then we, it's, it's got Argos in it, which sends the signal where the location of the whale is to a satellite, and, but that's in a delay of about an hour. And, and the satellites aren't always overhead from about noon to six, almost on the whole North Pacific, we don't get signal. Um, so we just, then we can go out with the VHF, it also has VHF inside that metal unit on the green buoy. So. So that's what we were looking for. But this picture you're seeing, this is after we reacquired the whale. And then to slow the whale down, we add poly balls. Kind of like in Jaws, when they added the barrels, same kind of thing. Next. So, so once we have a whale and we've done the assessment, then we put an action plan in place. This is the one that started in Monterey and was, went down to the Santa Barbara Islands. One of those boats is ours that we took everything down there twice. But on the second time, we were able to disentangle it. So and that was with that one in that one video. But yeah, and that whale there, which was real interesting, is and, and JV, who's or Justin Vespicki, who's part of NOAA, and we always have to call and tell him if we have an entanglement, and then you know just to make sure we can go in. And he kept calling me. He goes, "Oh, those fluke washed up on shore," and I go, "I think our whale made it." About 50 days later, we were out in Monterey Bay. I had a student from. Ireland, 
a high schooler who went to, in Colorado, from Colorado, but her grandparents live here, and um, Stephanie Marcos, who is now our operations manager. And we were going through the bay. We had just seen a shark that had its tail taken off. Someone cut it, and we were working on that. Then we were coming in, and I see this whale, and it had the sea lice right around the tail stock, and so we went in. But we were still on that 19-foot donzy, so we took a lot of pictures, but we did, couldn't confirm it was our same whale until I got home because, you know, we didn't have access to computers, but we do now on the big boat. Next. So, and then we have so many different tools, and if you um, tour a boat, you can see a lot of them, and there's different knives for different applications. So, and this is one of the hooked knives that um, is on a long carbon fiber pole. It used to be aluminum poles, which were very heavy, so we love the carbon fiber poles. And so, see, so you see the line up just behind here. That's where the cut's going to be made on that particular animal. So next. And we never get in the water with the whale. This was down in Morro Bay. They, I can't remember if they were shrimp, fish, no, not shrimp. I can't remember the, the, the um, fisheries. But they jumped on top of the whale, the guy with a knife. Um, no, he might have had a life jacket. We had another one last year. They jumped in with no life jacket. Um, and it looked like a simple one, like that f photo I told you from the Center for Coastal Studies. So they think they got it free, but Joseph Vespicki had looked at a lot of video. It, it, they didn't really disentangle it. And that's the problem is that, you know, and it's great that they want to help, but if he was killed, it would shut our, our responses for the whole state, for the whole country. So, and then he was on Ellen Jeanette, generous and she gave each fisherman ten thousand dollars <laughs> we haven't gotten any money no one in the state has gotten money unfortunately for from a talk show host <laughs> next and this is what happened in Canada and it did shut us down in the US as well this gentleman who is a level five which you have to be a level five to cut free uh, a right whale a North Atlantic right whale but we did have a North Pacific right whale just spotted just a few weeks ago. Um, he was, they had just finished disentangling it. And they're a total different beast because they can fold in half. A humpback whale doesn't fold in half. So if you're working on the head, the tail could get you. If you're working on the tail, the head could hit you. I was shocked when I learned that. And so it shut the fisheries down. And then they said we couldn't respond. Then we could respond and not do anything, but take pictures from afar. But then we had a, a grounded whale up north, and there was a lot of meetings and stuff, and, and it was grounded, so it wasn't moving. So it was a very concerted effort. It was way up north, so I, I wasn't there personally, but they were able to free it, which was great. Next. So now I'm going to go over a couple of case studies that um, we've had in 2022. In fact, I was supposed to present last year, but we had an entanglement call that Saturday, the first day, and I usually talk on Saturday. So I canceled that, and we responded. The whales come first. Next. So this was in um, March of 19, or, you know, March 19th last year. And so this was an animal that was entangled. This is the day that I went to respond. So we responded, and the Coast Guard was supposed to give boat tours, too. They came with us to be a standby vessel for us. So as we were um, um, lowering the wing off the back of our boat, they monitored the whale for us. Unfortunately, then someone fell off the cliffs down somewhere off of Big Sur, so they had to go. And oftentimes when a boat starts up and leaves, it changes their behavior, and the it started raining. We had the small boat and the big boat looking. And then it started raining, and then the fog moved, and I couldn't see the wing. I was in the wing, then I got on the big boat, because I thought, we don't need three of us in the small boat looking for this whale. And I couldn't see him. I said, no, nope, we're standing down, because that's dangerous. But the great news is, next, is on, oh, oh this is a video, I think. And that's nice because that whale actually flukes. Actually, a good whale to watch. 
And, and this is actually from a whale watch boat that was standing by. There were so many whale watch boats that stood by because we oh, were here dang. and it was way up north in Monterey Bay. And he just Next. So they took pictures and they sent them to us. So we had some information before we got on scene. Next. And then, um, of course, we stood down on Saturday. This is Monday. We responded because um, we actually we didn't respond. We actually went looking for the whale, and um, and someone had found it, so we were over there. And another um, group was coming out, um, but the seas got a little rough, so they didn't make it, and they had our drone operator. So the Coast Guard knows us very well. So the plane on the left, which is... Um, one of their bigger planes flew stern to bow over our boat, and I just picked up the radio and go, U.S. Coast Guard, U.S. Coast Guard. And then a little while later, this plane, little plane comes over, and no, they didn't say that there was a plane being sent, so we took a picture of the tail fin, sent it to um, one of our volunteers um, that is a pilot. Why can't I think of his name? You know him. Yeah. <laughs> And he found out it was a Coast Guard Auxiliary. Then Karen Yoder, who is also with us, is a flotilla commander here. She put us in touch with that pilot. And next, these are the pictures he got from the air. And you can see the whale through the gear. And oftentimes they will do that. But, you know, no matter what, we try to get the job done. <laughs> So, and then we met with them and, and did a presentation with them, and, the, and any time I've had entangled whales since, you know, and they'll even tell me when they're coming down, do you have any whales? Let us know where they're at, and we'll look. In fact, they helped with a whale, and they tried to go out. This is another whale, and I'll talk about it later. Um, but the marine layer was so thick, they had to stand down. Next. So, and this is um, an animal on March 28th. So, um, it was entangled. Um, next, and we were able to get a telemetry buoy on it, and next, and there's our specially designed um, wing that is hung from our davit system, so we can just crank it down and go. We don't have a motor cranking it, we hand crank it, because on the ocean things always freeze up and we don't want to have a problem with the motor, so we just do everything manually. Next. So we were able to attach the telemetry buoy. And it was late in the day, so we had to stand down. So, but that'll give us our signal. So next. Can you attach the buoy? To the working line, so the trailing line coming off the whale. There's a number of methods. We can grapple it. Ideally, and, and on this one is what we did, is we did an inline figure eight and clipped it in, because a grapple can come off. But if you put a grapple, you want to really make it bite into the line and then kind of loosely hang on to it and hope, help it twist so it stays on. Because they will stay on for a long time um, if properly done, but it's better if we have an inline eight. So, and these are the different spots that the telemetry, but then it, from here it went north. So we took our boat up to Half Moon Bay and we kept it there for over a month because it was up in Half Moon Bay, so we started searching up there. But um, somehow, and there was a lot of um, crab lines in the water up there, and in fact, on the, uh, my plotter, because we do a derelict program, too, where we remove derelict gear when we get the funding, um, that I put those on, and then I took the track and laid that on, and that whale went right through. And where I put up a crab, there was like probably four or five pot lines, you know, all the way across. So then we started losing signal, but it, it, as far, that's as far as north as we got pings. And then we didn't get any pings. Next. Over what period of time were all these um, um, Over about a couple, couple weeks. Then we lost signal. Um, and the weather was horrible, so we anytime there was a weather window, we went back up to Half Moon Bay and took the boat out and searched. But we didn't have a goniometer, which is will actually read from the telemetry. But the telemetry buoy was underwater 97% of the time. Um, and see this here. This is another ping, and this is when it was um, 300 miles straight west, kind or southwest from Moss Landing, and we thought, oh, come in shore. And after that, we didn't get another ping until next. 
Mexico. I, and this was like, from start to finish, 70 days. We never leave them on that long. Uh, and we did not have this new thing that was developed, which is a weak link, which we could have put on, but we, our team didn't have one yet. They had them in Hawaii, and they had one down south, but we didn't have that. So I called Justin Vizbicki. I said, we got to get the teams from Mexico. And this was later in the day. So then the next morning, I checked it. Next. It's no longer on the whale. It's on next to a post office. <laughs> so someone took it off. So we had a conference in San Diego um, last August, and those same team members came north. They got, retrieved our telemetry, but whoever cut it off thought that the telemetry was slowing the whale. Because of the, the nature of the entanglement, it was hard to see from the surface, so they cut it off. So anyway, next. And, um, oh, this is another one, sorry. Anyway. They didn't take a photo. We didn't have any idea of the body condition because that's a long time to have a telemetry on because the current telemetry is about 48 pounds, so it does create some drag. But it, they're able to dive with it and stuff. But we think it just got caught up in either lines or maybe a lot of kelp patties, and that that's what was keeping the telemetry underwater because from Moss Landing, the next point was there off of Mexico. But we got the telemetry back, which was very exciting. And then so this next whale, when we put a telemetry on, was um, the one from the Monterey Bay National Marine Sanctuary's boat, Fulmar. So and this one was on September 10th. Next, and you can see the buoys. So um, g running up to it, and they did attach to the working line. We hadn't put the telemetry on yet. It was a really calm day. Um, so, and we're getting underwater GoPro there. And in this, in fact, Danielle was there on this one. Um, that's you, I think, holding the pole, or that might have been the second crew that went out. But she had just done training. She's been with us a long time. And so I put her and Jane in our wing because we were waiting for more crew members, our drone operator, to come out. So I just had her drive the boat back and forth slow, about 120 yards from the whale. Then I said, go a little faster. What we were trying to do is acclimate the whale to the wings motor. Because every time a new boat comes in, it, you know, it's a new sound. And they're, you know, can hear so well. And, and Fred can attest to all this. And anyone that knows humpback whales, they're Tra sound travels so far in the water, and so they always seem to change the behavior when you add another boat. So we don't just race in. Okay, next. Um, so we attach the telemetry, and, and when we did put the tele telemetry on there, I put it on, and I, that whale didn't even flinch. It was so used to the motor, we just glided up and attached, and it was a thing of beauty. So th this is... Uh, the track. So this one couldn't dive. It never dove the whole time we were with it. So we got lots of pings. And I worked at every port trying to find vessels to take us out or whatever, but the weather did not cooperate. So then when it was near the Channel Islands, that's when our USS Coast Guard Auxiliary were ready to fly to take pictures from the air because we wanted to see if the entanglement had changed. I knew it hadn't changed in Monterey or in Morro Bay because when I called the Coast Guard to talk to them to see if maybe they could be a support vessel and we could bring one of our other boats out, one of our partner's boats, um, later that day he called me. He said, hey, a fisherman just reported a whale and they had telemetry on it and he told me the color and the color of the buoys and I go, that's our whale. So I was sort of confident that the entanglement hadn't changed, but it still went a long way. Then when it went into Morro Bay, we had a whale watch boat looking in that area, but they couldn't go outside that little, and it never came right inside where they were because it was really rough. And then we thought it was going to go inside the Channel Islands, but it didn't. So it went on the outside. I even pinged my high school friends, and finally, one of my friends that I knew from, I was 11 years old in Michigan, because I have a lot of Michigan people out here, he knew someone that knew someone on the Catalina Islands. So on um, Sunday, this guy, because I, I was watching it, because it couldn't dive, it, but it wanted to feed. And it was following a lot of the canyon edges. And when I started looking over there by Catalina Island, there was all these little 
tiny canyons. So I told that to this guy that runs pretty much everything on Catalina Island. I said, I think it's feeding. He goes, I think you're right because there's so much bait fish that they were catching all sorts of big fish feeding on that bait fish. But because we don't have any pings from about noon to six, a fisherman jumped in the water, no life jacket, says it cut it free, but we don't know because, you know, he ended up getting rid of all the gear because we could have pieced it back together had we had that the gear from the whale. And once he saw it, it says leave on whale and that it said Noah on that buoy because it was the sanctuary's buoy, he freaked out and dismantled it. <laughs> so, um, but he swears he got it free, but we really have no confirmation of that. Next. Yeah, yeah, oh yeah, 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 that's, and Justin Visbicki downloaded that, so he always had that. And, um, but we, the sanctuary got their telemetry back, the buoy, but the, the inner workings on the part that slides into the top, it, he had to get re, a new one or redone. So I just wanted to show you a comparison. This is that um, 2016 whale that we came down and disentangled in Santa Barbara Channel. And the, the track is real similar. And then it's interesting, in 16, I helped with the Pacific rowers um, when they did that crossing over from here to Hawaii. Three boats, I only knew of two at the time, but three of those boats, that the people had to be rescued. And Pete Bethune with East Earth Race in New Zealand was sponsoring one of those boats. He called me, he wanted me to go out and tow. And I said, well, Vessel Assist can do that. And they didn't even go out, it was so rough. And so I helped him, because we were on opposite time zones, they had these gold bricks that gave you constant um, Latin long. And so, and we had a captain down in LA, and just before it hit the rocks, um, I think it's on Point Conception, he was able to grab that one. But the other one went around the Channel Islands and was quite far offshore. So, and that was the one that Pete Bethune had sponsored. So the, the guy that was on that boat that got rescued, went out with the captain. They had a sat phone, but you knew where the whale was, and then you knew when they grabbed on the whale, because you could see it, because I was just like glued to the computer. And then we go, they got it, they got it. And then all of a sudden, they didn't have it. You could tell just from the position and the, where it was drifting. But it was really interesting how it drifted was so close to that 2016 whale, but that whale was not using its fluke, and so it must have been using the currents. So I thought that was fascinating. Um, and they were able to catch that one too, so we were able to s save two of the boats, but there was a third we knew nothing about. By then it was off the coast of Mexico somewhere. Next. So, and the, this is a volunteer that helped me bring the boat down for the boat for tours on Thursday was in Mexico. He was telling me about this video, so I just took screenshots. This is the detrimental effects that can happen from a whale being entangled. This is not a whale from our area or anything. This is off of La Paz, Mexico, and he um, took these footage, this footage by drone. So you can see the body condition, the, all the sea lice. Um, it, it's just sad. Next. And, and even on this bottom right one, you can see it like the, the line has, you know, throughout its journey, kind of shredded its f tips of its flukes. It's on the, the left side. Um, and you can, just, it's just, but it is sad. It's, it's a slow and painful death. And so th that's why we started the whale entanglement team. Next. But there's a lot of people working on the problem. And a lot of you have seen this slide before. That's Calder Dyerly. Um, he's a crab fisherman here, and he's all about mitigating entanglements. And, and they shorten their lines. Next. Um, they shorten their lines. They used to have a lot of line in the water column. They shorten the line from the pot to the main buoy, and then they shorten the, the line from the main buoy to the trailer buoy. The trailer buoy is what they hook on to pull their pots up. Next. And there's other people. I met this gentleman in Halifax. He now has this particular, this is a ropeless um, retrieval of traps that uh, um, fishermen can use. Um, at the time when I met him, he could only lift about 60, 70 pounds. I said, well, that's not enough crab. Commercial pots are um, 130, 40 pounds. Now they can even lift the ones that you see in Alaska. 
next. Now, there's also whales that wash up dead. Um, this one, didn't, we didn't see any line. We first learned about it in June of 21, that's on the left. And then in August, one of our volunteers was walking on the beach. Um, a lot of universities, Moss Landing Marine Lab, um, others, um, Cal Academy, they come down and take samples and things to try to figure out what happened to the whale. And then a volunteer of, our, of ours let Stephanie Marcos, our operations manager, know that skull was on the beach. And then she called the next day about 1 o'clock, and she said, it's still there. So I'm like, I called Justin Vespicki. I said, we want that skull because we do so much education. And he goes, well, that's a lot of hoops. I said, just give them to me, and I'll jump. <laughs> so we did um, next we were able to retrieve it. This is the, that afternoon. We thought we were going to roll that on the cart up the hill and put it in our van. <laughs> but, but it's really interesting because you see, there's a lot of people that were just walking on the beach, and they were helping. Next. And now play this video, and you'll see one lady. She's in the forefront. She's got her four cane walker, or, or cane, and she's holding on the four the prong part and <laughs> scooping out sand for us. See, <laughs> the, everyone wanted to help. It was, it was amazing. But then we broke our cart, and there's several of our volunteers. James there with the blue shirt, tugging hard there. I didn't even remember us moving it that far until I saw this video that we put together for the talk. And then I called the Pebble Beach Company because they're another partner of ours. And so they said, well, we can't help you today, but we could tomorrow. I said, great. So, and after getting, we had to jump through a lot of hoops. We had to talk to the sanctuary, Moss Landing Marine Lab, because they had to come down and physically give us the clearance to take this, because it's an endangered species. So the next day, I got a, a trailer from Home Depot and um, went down, and they brought the 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 skull, plus there was two, um, the left and right mandible as well. But then he said, well, we can't cross from Pebble Beach side to uh, Silmar without state parks. We had to get authorization from state parks. But uh, what I learned about it at 1 o'clock the day before, and by 11.30 that day, it was in my driveway. <laughs> so we made it happen. Um, but we couldn't have done it without all these people. And then Home Depot donated a lot of wood, and um, we have that in, um, in next in a box, but Moss Landing Boat Works were kind enough to lift it off the trailer and allow us to do tests, and we used the, our CSUMB. Well, you were there, Rosie. <laughs> she was one of our service learners at the time, and to do different tests, and so next. And so that's um, a bunch of them in front of it there. Um, then we were measuring the mandibles. The mandibles are buried in a sandy yard. And, but we didn't want to bury that skull because it was so big and heavy, so we built, we put it on a pallet that Home Depot gave us, and then we, oh, and I forgot to add a Vila construction with Ambari. Um, John, that was, they filled our box from the sand from your new site across from there, and the one guy jumped in, he's tapping the dirt. I mean, they were awesome, and m m one of my board of directors, Mikey Price, and his sister who was in, uh, the Naval Postgraduate School um, built it for us. So it's, it, d it takes a whole community to do the work we do. But next. And then we also have done this in the past. We didn't get the funding when we applied last time, but they didn't give anyone money from on the West Coast. So we didn't get that. But if we can get more funding in the future, but it, that we need a lot of funding for that. Um, the first time we got a grant for $100,000 from the National Fish and Wildlife Foundation. And <clears throat> the interesting thing is the commercial crabbers are the ones that are start later for their season and end earlier. But about 65 to 70 percent of the gear we brought up was from recreational crabbers. People that can buy a crab pot at Costco, they weigh four pounds to maybe 15 pounds. They're easily, during storms, lifted by kelp that's out there or the waves, and then they drop below the surface. So we would we used a 4125 edge tech scanner and found the different lines and pots, and then we hired Dr. Calder Diarly that was in on the um, working group that to retrieve those. Next. 
So these are some of the things you can help with. Um, and if, especially if you spot a untangled whale, and I should have brought some more marine mammal guides in here, but you can stop at our booth, they're free, they're waterproof. They have beautiful illustrations by Peter Falcons of the different whales and dolphins you can see off the California coast. Um, but um, you can invite us to speak at your club or whatever. So next. Oh, I guess that's it. <laughs> <laughs> and that's our album when we first got it, and that's Whiskey the Whale Spotter who passed away. She used to come on the boat always, and she'd help us spot whales. She was amazing. But, um, but, and I didn't talk a lot about the education side of things, but in 2012, we had to pick between education and um, research, and we went with education, because the education, without educating the public and students, and, and we have volunteers, Starting as not long, as young as nine, and as up, they start at seventy or seventy-one, and we've inspired a lot of people to young people and older people to go back to college. One of them is Victoria Wade. She started with us in two thousand seven. We don't charge for that. We want to. I always wanted to pay it forward because I was given that opportunity. So um, you can volunteer. You can volunteer on the boat events. You know posting posters around town or, you know, all sorts of things you can help with. So, and I, I don't know if there's one after that or not. <laughs> I haven't been following around. Thank you. <laughs> and if you have any questions. N normally our water is not that clear. This is way off of Carmel, uh, between Carmel and um, Big Sur. It, it was, looks like Maui water, but it usually you can't. I had a whale five feet from the boat, put the GoPro in, you couldn't even see the whale. <laughs> Any questions? Oh yeah, 877 SOS whale. And it, it, you can dial the E, but it's like one letter too long, but we didn't care. <laughs> it just worked well. Yeah, and we do, in, and on our marine mammal guides, our booth's just right in the Custom House Plaza. It has the number, and if you run into an entangled well, it tells you what to do and look for, and if you can stand by, if you can't, take photos. Like we had a fisherman report one once. He took a picture with a cell phone, and we were able, because Noah keeps track of all the entangled whales, and, you know, we get a lot of reports, but then we had that same whale later, like a month or so later, but they just counted it as one whale because he took a picture and we compared it to everything on that response and it worked out great. Oh. So as your wonderful world, how many whales have you seen and what can be added to that? Well, um, yeah, I, I don't, I should have the number, but I don't have that on the top of my head. Um, but to, for whales, we usually, it used to be less expensive, but the fuel's gone up. So we we're figuring it costs almost probably, it depends on the whale, like the whale that we spent so much time in Half Boom Bay costs a lot more money than normal. That probably costs us six, $7,000. But, um, you know, on average, about 2500 to two, uh, 3000 um, It depends, you know, we might just be out there one day, that would be less maybe, but we rarely disentangle one in one day. We've had, I think, two or three that we've done in that short period of time. The one from Monterey to Santa Barbara was 17 days from start to finish. So, you know, but it's, it's more now. I mean, just maintaining the boat, all the mechanics and all the electricians, their rates went way up. Fuel, st I mean, at, it's better at the pump when you get gas for your car, but not at the fuel docks. It's not inexpensive. <laughs> I don't know, that's a good one. Um, I'd be taking a shot in the dark, maybe 20? You know, I don't know. I. I, I should have the information, but I don't. <laughs> Sorry. Yep. Hi, Wayne. Catch all of what you were talking about in terms of a better way. But I lost thought that if you could have the, the uh, boy and the line on the on the uh, tra uh, the, the trap. Well, on the trailing line. Okay. Yes.
Well, we there's line on the whale. If we can't get it disentangled in that one day, that's when we attach the telemetry buoy to the trailing line. We would take those orange buoys off because we don't want those to be an extra drag on the whale. But um, but yeah, we attach that, and and that's why we knew those tracks. You know, other than that one that went to Mexico, because it, it, somehow the telemetry got fouled, so it wasn't coming to the surface very often. Oh, the trap down below? Yeah, and why not have the boy and the line on the trap and release it for the radio signal? Oh, people are working on that. In fact, there's a place in Marina, but when we were in Halifax and I met the gentleman um, that had, like, they're like dive bags, but they're extra heavy duty. There's no line in that. You can either set a timer to it to come up on at a certain time, or they had one of those things you could um, beep it and, and release it. But the, I showed that to Ed Lyman, who goes around the world training, and around our country too, but him and Dave Matilla, he did not like the ones that had rope in the pot, because if the pot broke open, then there you have line, whereas the other one would just be the trap and that bag, which the whale isn't gonna get entangled in that like dive bag, because I, the bigger ones, they're like, when they're inflated, are probably like this big, you know, and, they're, and, and, and bigger ones, you know, for depending on what fisheries. But um, he's been working with Woods Hole, um, the Department of Commerce, NOAA, and he told me last year at smelt.org, he said last year they opened a lobster ground that they had never, they haven't opened, but they could only fish with that ropeless so they're making strides, but the government works very slowly. And plus, there's an expense to the car the fishermen, you know, lobster, spot prawn, whatever. So, you know, but there's a lot of money spent rescuing one. And, and even then, only two-thirds of the whales that are um, entangled, we don't even know what fisheries they're from. There's only a few fisheries that mark their gear, so they're working on that as well. So there's a lot of people working in different solutions and hopefully you know we can find that but there's also gear out there from old ships you know marine debris that they get and we even had one in fred was and on that one that it got entangled in a sea dip buoy out here it's the only first time there a whale's been entangled in a no a buoy it was from scripps and that poor thing and fred was there remember that one on the sea dip buoy fred it was so sad um um Moss Landing Marine Lab went out because um, Scripps had called them, but they didn't see a whale, um, and and they didn't see the buoy. But then Jim, I can't think of his last name, but he's out of Santa Cruz as a fisherman. He was out there. He had no cell signal, or it, and it was so far, and he wasn't near poets to for a radio call, I guess. But when he came in shore, he said he saw it, that this whale was entangled to that. And then the weather was so crappy, we couldn't go out for four or five days, and the Fulmar took us out because it was 30 miles off Point Pinos. And that was a very sad case because um, usually when you go to disentangle a whale, just before you'll tap the back of the knife, which is dull, on the tail or the fluke or a part of the body to see how the whale will react. Fred did that, and it just went right in the tail. And... And that whale had no skin on its fluke at all because that line, it was like being on a leash for almost like three weeks, three and a half, or yeah, about three weeks, a little over. And we never saw that whale again. And we would recognize that whale, so I don't think that one would make it. Partially because of the infection that probably killed the whale in the end. Yeah, it, it's it's very sad. That's why, you know, if I have to give a presentation, we have an entangled whale. I cancel because <laughs> the whale's more important. Does anyone else have any questions? Oh, back in the room. Go ahead. Oh, that's a very good question. She wanted to know what if you, when you disentangle a whale, what happens to the gear? We bring the gear back and we lay it out and. Um, 
figure, you know, we kind of know where the whale was entangled at, and we take measurements of the line, the weight of the line, the um, how it floats in the water, because there's different types of line. Um, and then th we, they do try, Noah tries to return it to the fishermen. They don't always want it back because they think they're going to get in trouble, but, um, but we always offer that. And some of it we use for educational purposes, that kind of thing. And we have line that we use when we're training, too. Because, you know, we teach not tying to people, but, you know, you have nice line, it's easy to tie a knot. To tie an inline eight with a slimy, barnacle-y line out on the ocean, and that line's stiff, it's hard, so we practice with that. So it's more real world. You know, we'll start with the soft rope and then move to the harder rope. Anyone else have a question? Well, thank you very much, and you're going to love Fred's talk. <laughs> And he's up one of our partners, and he was on our slide for all the partners we think. <laughs> thank you, Peggy, so much. That was a really interesting presentation, and we have a little thank you. Oh, thank you. Yes, so thank you, so thank you for coming in today. So we have another speaker set here in a minute. Um, we'll take a very quick two, three-minute break, and then we'll, we'll join right back on.